Name credentials, what are they? How do you use them? And how can you use them to help simplify, secure, and streamline your API integrations with Salesforce? Before we begin, my name's Pei Huang. I'm the CTO of the Salesforce practice here at Groundswell Cloud Solutions. We're part of the Giantsis family of companies. I've been working in the Salesforce ecosystem for about the last nine years in many different technical roles from developer up to architect, and of course, in my leadership role today. Name credentials are a fantastic piece of technology, and I hope that by the end of today, you all agree, uh, agree as well. In today's session, what I'll plan to do is go through a bit of background about API callouts, integrations, and credential storage. I'll talk through some of the common options that people pursue and some of the problems that come with these. I'll introduce name credentials, talk through the benefits of them, and show specific examples, including code, that helps you understand better how you can use name credentials in your projects. Towards the end, I'll also cover some more advanced use cases and highlight some of the new features that have come out in Salesforce uh, for name credentials as recently as this year. Let's, let's get started. First of all, what are callouts? So HTTP callouts in Salesforce are a very common form of integration you might find when you wish to connect Salesforce to other systems. In many, many different companies, you may have other APIs, other external systems that could be anything from legacy third-party applications, back office systems, or maybe even other weird edge cases like scraping web pages for content that you need to consume inside of Apex. In addition to that, this may include things like third-party systems, payment processing, telephony, Jira, bug tracking, all sorts of different things that you may wish to integrate your Salesforce instance to. Here is uh, three lines of code that should be very familiar to many Apex developers. Here is a simple callout that I'm making from within my Apex class to this uh, fancy API at example.com. You can see it's pretty straightforward. I set that endpoint, set the method, um, and define that request. I go ahead and construct it, get it ready, and hit send. So that was a really, really simplistic example, right? And I think many people would agree that this is not realistic in most companies' organizations. And the reason for that is because most APIs will require you to authenticate. You know, of course, you can't just have APIs that are open to the world to allow anybody to access your company's secrets, PII, and other things. But it's also important to remember that many other constraints may exist. And you may have different credentials for your different environments between production, development, testing, QA, staging, and so on. And depending on the system you're connecting to, these may have different authentication mechanisms, some which are really straightforward, like passwords or secret keys, to really complex ones that are a little harder for people to understand, like OAuth or JWT tokens, or even some custom authentication schemes in some cases. And then finally, the other dimension to this is your integrations might run as a system user or an integration user. You know, this is where your org uses the same credentials to connect to that um, particular external system um, and does everything on behalf of, of the user. Or alternatively, there may be reasons why each individual Salesforce user needs to use different credentials to access the external systems. As you can see, this can make callouts much more complicated than that three-line example I showed a slide before. So one of the things that we sort of get to then is the question of how do we store these credentials? How do we make it so that our Apex code can properly authenticate with um, external systems? And a question you might ask is, you know, why can't I just put those usernames, passwords, keys, things like that in my Apex code? Well, there's several, several key reasons. You know, the first one is, of course, it becomes an absolute maintenance nightmare. You know, imagine if your passwords are changing every 90 days, every six months, whatever it is, that requires you to deploy code changes to production every time that that occurs. And of course, that can cause a lot of disruption to the business. It can be really difficult to maintain changes between different environments. You, know, you have different credentials between your development, testing, and production environments, and you don't want to have to change code every single time. You, know, you really want an admin to be able to do that as simply and straightforward as possible. And then finally, it's not really secure, right? Any code that you have get committed up to your Git repository or other sorts of places may make those credentials visible to other members of your team, developers, external consultants, people like that. Things that you don't really want to expose because these credentials can be very powerful at times. 
And of course, you know, when you do sandbox refreshes and other things, you want to make sure that your important production credentials don't be available to others, or even worse, you end up with a non-production system connecting to your production ERP or backend financial systems. That can be a recipe for disaster. So then you might ask yourself, well, Salesforce has had different configuration options for years. You know, custom settings, custom objects, custom metadata types, labels, all sorts of things. Why can't I just put it in one of those? And, you know, in, in some ways you can, right? You could put credentials inside a custom setting or custom metadata type. You know, you use this to avoid hard coding. You may even put URLs and things in there. You may have to put together some little Apex utility classes to make things easier. But the reality is some of these technologies and some of these options within Salesforce were just never really designed to store secrets. Things like custom labels were, were really intended for localization, for translations, not for storing credentials. You know, why, why do you need a French translation of your password, for example? That, that makes no sense and is particularly error prone there. And then also there are limited, limited ways to protect sensitive keys and passwords and things like that if you're storing them inside custom settings or custom metadata types. So what is the solution to all of this? And you know, I wanted to quote uh, Salesforce MVP, uh, Kevin Pullman, who wrote this in a blog uh, many years ago. He said, name credentials offload the storage of credentials and authentication to a declaratively controlled process. Now, this is really aligned with Salesforce's mantra of clicks and code. So let's look at some examples. You know, first of all, let's look at a traditional way of authenticating um, a basic uh, API callout to an external system. Uh, the way that we do it is similar to the example I showed before. Construct the request, set the endpoint, set the method. You'll go ahead and you know, grab your username and password. Um, in this case, I'm hard coding it, but you may have put this in a custom setting or somewhere else like that. You will go ahead and construct the authorization header. Um, so in this case, we need to concatenate those and encode that to put that in the authorization header. We set that header, and then we go ahead and we send the request. So, you know, this is pretty common, right? You'll see this in the documentation. You'll see lots of examples of people doing it this way. But maybe there's an easier way. So what we can do with name credentials is we can go into the setup section of Salesforce to declaratively configure this particular callout endpoint. We go ahead and create a name credential. In this case, I give it a name, my fancy API. I specify the base URL for this. And then I define the type of identity type and the protocol that is being used here. So in this case, I'm saying it's a named principle, which means one account for the whole Salesforce org. And then I'm doing a simple username and password. And here I can store that username and password inside this particular setting. By doing that, that's all sort of stored behind the scenes. Salesforce securely stores that in the background. And you can't get access to that password ever again um, unless you're using it in a call out. So then what are the basic examples then of what this would look like if we go ahead and use that name credential in our call out? Well, the simple thing is we start again with our HTTP request, but for the endpoint, instead of hard coding the URL or, or grabbing that from a custom setting, we can now reference that name credential that we specified before. In this case, by its developer name, my underscore fancy underscore API. And I can add ad additional sort of URL suffixes and paths and things to it, depending on what I'm trying to do with this API. I then go ahead, set the method, and I can go straight ahead and start sending that request. You'll see in this code example here, I'm not having to do anything with headers. I'm not having to do anything with usernames or passwords. That's all just done for me magically behind the scenes without any worry. So that was a really simple example. But what about a more complex authentication protocol? Now, OAuth 2.0 has been around for many years and is a very secure and well-trusted industry standard for authentication. And many of your popular APIs, including Salesforce's own APIs, use OAuth 2.0 and any variants or many of the variants of it to allow people to access this data and system securely. But the problem with OAuth 2.0 is it is quite complicated to understand. There's many steps in the process, many things that you need to do to get authenticated, get the right tokens, store the tokens, use them, um, and many moving parts for you to understand. 
And likewise, there's things to worry about around token expiry and refreshing expired tokens uh, when they expire so that the user doesn't get prompted again, things like that. And it all makes a lot of sense, but it can be a little bit complicated to implement on your own. So this is where name credentials once again comes in to save the day. Um, in this example, what we need to do is we need to start by defining an auth provider first. You know, this is going to be referenced in our name credential when we go and set that up at the next stage. So in this particular auth provider, I'm actually wanting to authenticate to a Google API. And in this case, I've called it Google test. I've specified my consumer key and consumer secret that I got from my Google Cloud project. I've gone ahead and specified authorized endpoint URLs, token endpoint URLs, user info endpoint URLs, and the scopes and things like that that I received from the Google side of the fence. Once I've put that in place, I can go ahead and create the name credential. And this screen will look very familiar to you because it's basically the same screen as before for the basic example. But instead of username and password, I'm saying I'm using OAuth 2.0, and I'm selecting that Google test auth provider that I had before. One of the things you'll notice on this screen is a little checkbox down the bottom that says start authentication flow on save. If I go ahead and tick that and then I hit save, setup will redirect me to actually authenticate with this API through OAuth 2.0 and store all the necessary tokens so that that name credential is ready to use. So in this case, it'll take me to log in with my Google account um, and I'll be good to go once I go through all the different prompts and things uh, from there on. Pretty simple, right? So then let's take a look at the code. What does this mean for us in Apex? Well, we once again construct the HTTP request. We set the endpoint referencing the name credential. You know, this is probably looking pretty familiar to many of you at this point. We're setting the method. We're going ahead and, oh, right. Again, I'm skipping right through to simply sending that request. I don't have to set any headers. I don't have to worry about getting any codes, tokens, refreshing tokens, anything like that with OAuth. That's all handled behind the scenes by Salesforce for me. And all I need to do is have these very simple lines of code in this example. So if we really look at this in more detail, what does Salesforce do for you with the OAuth 2.0 uh, authentication flow? Well, first of all, it allows you to handle those web server flows via those declarative setup screens, right? You're not having to manually do this with Postman or with anything else or code it yourself. It's just handled there and set up, paste in a few keys and settings and away you go. It allows you to go ahead and generate and append that authorization header for you automatically. And what's really important as well is that if that token ever expires, which it will, um, it, so long as you have granted the right refresh token permissions, um, will handle the refresh token flow for you. And this is all completely and totally transparent to the developer and to the end user. So then for some people in the audience, you may have some questions around more advanced use cases. You know, The two examples I've shown you use a simple authorization header, whether that's coming from username and password or from an OAuth flow. But what about APIs that don't use authorization headers? What if they use something else? You know, this may be a really custom legacy system you have that requires you know, a certain key to be placed in a certain part of the request or something like that. Well, this is where the merge fields concept with name credentials comes in handy. Now, what we need to do is look at these callout options, which are at the bottom of the setting for name credentials when we create those. And we have the ability to sort of decide what we want to do. Now, by default, the generate authorization header tick box is ticked. And this is exactly how we let the two previous examples work because it sets those, exa those, those headers for us. But then in these examples where we can't use that, we may choose to untick that box and instead tick one of these two following options, either allowing merge fields in the HTTP header or allowing merge fields in the HTTP body. And the key thing with both of these is this allows you to do complex things like, for example, setting a custom x dash auth dash key header or something in your in your HTTP request. Um, or maybe you need to put it in the body of the request, you know, as part of an XML payload or JSON payload or something like that. And one such example is Salesforce's SOAP API if you're trying to access Salesforce metadata. So what does this look like? Well, for anyone who's been using Salesforce for a while, you're pretty familiar with how merge fields work inside other parts of the platform, 
looks exactly the same. Here I can use the dollar credential um, global variable and access things like the username or password if it is using that particular authentication scheme. So in this case, I'm setting in that top row two custom headers for username and password on that HTTP request. But I can also grab for OAuth flows the OAuth token. And again, dollar credential dot OAuth token. Um, and Salesforce will substitute those values in at the time that that code runs. There's many other options here, so take a look at the documentation, and Salesforce is continually improving the product, so take a look at changes that may come out in the release notes as years go by. Now, one specific example I wanted to call out, and this is a real problem and business case that we had a few years ago in a customer project, was attempting to use the Apex wrapper for Salesforce's metadata API. You know, this was a scenario where we didn't want to hard code usernames and passwords, but there wasn't an obvious way on how to use name credentials for it. So in this sort of case, what we ended up having to do was to change one of the generated uh, Apex classes to reference the metadata and then, sorry, reference the name credential, and then using that merge field syntax that I mentioned before um, to set the session ID on the request for that to go out. So this ended up working really well, right? This allowed us to use name credentials in places where perhaps API tokens or session tokens aren't really available, things like batch classes and other places. And it was a really, really good solution. Uh, for anyone who's interested, check out that blog uh, referenced in the bottom of the slide. This is where I provided more details about the scenario and of course the sample code as well. So hopefully name credentials are sounding pretty cool so far. But there are other benefits as well and other reasons why you should use name credentials. The first one is there's no need to add remote site settings. Once you've added it as a name credential, that also tells Salesforce that yes, as an admin or developer architect, you trust that URL, you can make call outs to that API from Salesforce. You can reference the same name credential and code across environments. So if your Apex code is written once, it references the Google test um, name credential, that code doesn't need to be changed between your development, QA, production, staging, training, whatever environments. All you need is an admin to go and quickly jump into setup and update the details in the name credential, and everything just magically works. And of course, the last bit is it's super easy for admins to maintain, right? Um, by decoupling the relationship between the authentication and the code, it allows developers to remain arm's length of production credentials, for example, um, and allow any specific people to go ahead and add those, maintain those in the production environment. And finally, and probably the most important point here, is that it allows the secure storage of credentials inside Salesforce. You know, Salesforce will store these securely for you behind the scenes and protect them very well so that they don't fall into the wrong hands. One other thing to sort of mention, and I touched on this earlier on, was you know, the different types of authentication where we may do it as a, a named principal, which means it's one user, or it's uh, multiple users and different people need different credentials. So the different thing here is, hey, if I need different sales reps to use their own username and password to access a third party system, what I can do is choose the per user identity type when I create the name credential. And you can see that on the left. And then what each individual user can do. These can be regular Salesforce users, they don't have to be admins, can go into their settings. And from their settings, go and actually specify the details for that particular name credential. So in this case, my user is going in and say, anytime my user uses this name credential, I'm going to use this username and this password for that. That's great, right? Admins don't have to ask, develop, ask end users for their credentials or anything like that. It's all pretty self-service and pretty easy to use. So to recap on everything that we've learned today, you know, first and foremost, I think name credentials are pretty awesome. You know, name credentials solve that problem that we have and we don't want to reinvent the wheel for, which is storing, maintaining, and using secure credentials for integrating Salesforce with external APIs. It allows us to avoid having to hard code any credentials in Apex and makes maintenance a lot easier. And then it empowers admins to maintain and manage the credentials in different environments without having to interrupt developers or require code changes to do so. It also secures the storage of credentials inside Salesforce for many different schemes of authentication, whether that's basic username and password, 
OAuth or other sorts of schemes and makes it really simple for everyone involved. Finally, um, as we sort of wrap up this presentation, uh, a lot has actually changed in the world of name credentials over the last few years. You know, I've been using name credentials for many, many years now, and you know, in summer 19, um, Salesforce released some additional authentication protocols you know, for AWS Signature v4 to integrate with AWS services, JOT and JOT Token Exchange, which is increasingly common and used in many different environments, and then also allowing outbound connections via Private Connect uh, to securely connect between Salesforce and AWS environments using AWS Private Link. So a really cool security addition for the security conscious out there. And then finally, in the Winter 23 Salesforce release, Salesforce brought out some additional capabilities. This is a bit of a new architecture for name credentials that adds additional concepts to it called external credentials that give you the ability to do more cool and powerful things. You know, these include things like custom name key value pairs for headers that get set in your callouts. It allows you to assign credential access based on permission sets rather than globally and it gives you a new lightning native setup UI. Of course, both types are still available. So if you prefer not to use the new name credentials, you can still go back to the legacy classic name credentials that I showed you before. But this is definitely something worth exploring for anyone who has more complicated use cases, more control that they need um, than what was previously offered before. <clears throat> Finally, to close out, here are a bunch of resources for you to check out if you want to learn more about name credentials or callouts or security in general. Um, there's some great resources here on Trailhead, great documentation, super badges and things you can work through. And I really highly recommend that anyone who's interested in integrational security spends a bit of time to go through these and really learn what it means to do things the secure and the right way. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, Really look forward, looking forward to you enjoying the use of name credentials and your projects. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks so much.